you will, look with me in your Bibles in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. We have concluded our study in Leviticus, or in Numbers, and uh, we'll just keep right on going through the scriptures here, so long as the Lord gives me breath. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, I want us to consider together the first eight verses and speak with you about the Word of God. We live in a day where the Word of God is being challenged in every way. Some of it is pretty blatant in the way that men approach it, just denouncing it altogether as being just of men. Another method which is just as evil but a little bit more deceptive is the subtleness of the way that men are taking the Bible and retranslating it. You can go into uh, bookstores and find all kinds of versions and it's no wonder that people question what's right because you stand there and look at all of these and it, it causes nothing but confusion. I have often said to you that whenever there's a doubt, uh, even if you're in, a, in an office working somewhere and you've got a copy of something that you question, where do you go back to? The original. You go back to the source. You don't just build a whole case on a copy. And there are many copies of God's Word out there, but there's only one original. And so, as we go through these scriptures, a lot of people ask me, well, why do you use the King James Version? Isn't it archaic? You know, who understands the King James today? Well, uh, I will give you a, just a, a little example. When you study Shakespeare in English class, do you study it in a modern interpretation of it, or do you go back and read it in its original form? I guarantee if it's an English teacher worth her salt, she's going to take you right back to the original and you're going to sit down and look at it and study it. And uh, it's still being taught today in school. So this whole notion that somehow because of the years that have gone by that this Bible that we hold in our hands is archaic is just an excuse not to want to deal with, with uh, you know, the truth. The reason I use it and encourage it is because I've looked at a lot of different versions and I still have not found one where the translators were as careful in how they looked at the original and studied it and endeavored to give us as close as possible to what the original is, even to the degree of putting in italics here words that are not in the original and yet they will they will put them in italics in order to from their perspective fill in but if you have any question you can always go back to the original and so uh, I believe it's important and you'll see some ita italics in, in here as we go down through that's why they're there they're filling in parts that and if you've ever done any translating it's difficult I worked uh, overseas for a number of years and there are just some languages that are, it's hard to translate certain, certain words. The, uh, the language of the country that I grew up in doesn't even have thank you in the language because if you thank somebody, you're, you're really shoving them off. If you thank a woman for a meal, you're telling her, I don't ever want another meal. <laughs> You're, it's a goodbye. So they just have never, never, they don't have a word for thank you. And so you're trying to, uh, you're trying to accommodate these differences in translation, but uh, I truly believe that what we have here is as close to the original as what you're going to be able to find. But let me, the reason why I've introduced it that way is because we are talking about the Word of God his promises and that's really where Moses 
here begins in verse 1. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and uh, Dizahab. You can take a map and look at it. It's just it was on the east side of, of the Jordan River straight across from, from Jericho, really, was where they were. And there, the, it says here, there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. That's an interesting little statement because by distance, there was only 11 days journey from Mount Sinai, Horeb, down, down in the southern part of the peninsula up to Kadesh Barnea, which was right at the edge of of the land and yet it took Israel 40 years 40 years to travel that 11 days journey again we know why a whole generation had passed but Moses is just reminding them here that it wasn't for any lack is what we're going to find of God's faithfulness it wasn't for any disruption in, in God's purpose that that these things happened but because of their sin and it came to pass in the 40th year in the 11th month so it tells us exactly the time doesn't it 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them after he had slain Sion the king of the Amorites which dwelt in Heshon and Og the king of Bashan which dwelt in Ashtaroth in Edrei, on this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto all the, the places nigh thereunto in the plain in the hills and in the vale and in the south and by the seaside to the land of the Canaanites and unto Lebanon unto the great river the river Euphrates behold I have set the land before you go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob to give unto them and to their seed after them you see here again what the Lord swear that he would do. The Lord commanded his word. That's what's important. That's what's vital, even above the words of, of men. Now this book here, Deuteronomy, the name uh, is actually a Greek title that uh, was superimposed or given to it uh, when they wrote the Septuagint. In other words, they translated the Old Testament scriptures into the Greek language uh, because so many of the Jews had uh, been in dispersion for so long after the captivity in Babylon that many of them could not even read the original anymore. And so they translated, uh, there were 70 men 70 Jews, that's where they get the name Septuagint, 70 Jews that took the time to translate the scriptures into the Greek language. Uh, I know some purists would like to think perhaps that uh, when Christ came that he always quoted from the, from the Hebrew, but the apostles and, the, and Christ himself often quoted from the Septuagint. So this idea that translations are somehow false doesn't, doesn't fly. Even our Lord had the ability to use the Hebrew, but uh, you're going to find many of the quotations were taken right out of the Septuagint, wherein it was you know, in, in line with, with the original. And so Deuteronomy literally means the second law. Deuter, duos, we get that. Two, and then nomos, meaning uh, law. Now, 
the thing that I would quickly hasten to say here is that it's not a new or different law from the first. As we, as we read through this book, we're going to see that it's a reiteration again of God's law to this generation that was raised up in the wilderness. Uh, the reason why that's important is because we're going to see that God does not lower his standard just because sinners can't meet it. I think the mindset of, of many people is, well, who can obey the law? So what's plan B? When you read the scriptures, you're going to find out that God's law does not change. And regardless of man's inability to keep it or to adhere to it, it's still the law. It's still the law. And down through the generations, we see that God held them accountable to it, even though nobody could keep it. You say, well, what was the whole purpose? Well, to shut them up to Christ, who would come and actually fulfill the law and lay down his life to pay its penalty, that God might be a just God and Savior. All right? So remember that those to whom Moses is writing here or speaking is a generation that for the most part, except for Joshua, Caleb, and Moses, had been born in the wilderness. They were even a generation removed from the Passover. Anything with regard to the Passover, they had to have been taught by their parents as to, in the Exodus as to what took place. And uh, they were born in this 40 years of wandering under God's chastening hand, even though they had nothing to do with it. So again, we see a picture of representation, of imputation, uh, where they were, they were raised in this, in this circumstance. You know, I, I think about how privileged our children are uh, for now to have been born in a generation not of wandering, when I think about even my own wanderings in religion, in wilderness, I thank the Lord that my children at least have been, been raised not in that wandering time, but in a time where mom and dad are settled in the land, so to speak. <laughs> what a blessing. But um, nonetheless, they're, they're, all of us can identify with this wilderness wandering of uh, going from place to place and not, not being settled in Christ, not knowing him. And uh, I believe that, you know, the Lord has graciously, just like these, he's going to bring them into that promised land that their parents did not enjoy. All of this is, is uh, you can stop and dwell on it for a while, the, the picture of, of God's providence and how he leads. And, and, uh, but it's all him. It's all of his doing, the wandering and the bringing into the land. None of this, we could say, was ever a deviation from what he purposed. But let's don't take for granted what he's given to us, even now, uh, with the gospel and uh, what we're privileged to hear week in and week out. But this is Moses' farewell sermon that we're going to read here. Uh, he already knows that he's not going to enter into that land. And so these words... The, the Lord has inspired, put upon his heart to speak to the children of Israel and it's what we're privileged to hold in our hands today even though written many, many years ago. Some estimate that this was written around 1450 B.C. before Christ. So if that's the case, then we're going on, we're reading words that were penned uh, nearly 3,450 years ago. We get all excited when there's a book 500 years old, you know, but here's one 3,450 that we hold in our hand. And that Moses spoke to the children of Israel and the Spirit of God uh, caused to be written. In the first five verses of this chapter, we have the, the, the time of, of this sermon and, of course, the place uh, where it was preached. 
But overall, as we go down through this chapter, we're reminded of several things. One, as I read in verses 6 through 8, which is going to be the focus of, of this message, the promise that God made them of the land of Canaan. And that's really where I want us to dwell. Aren't God's promises sure or aren't they? Can we rest in what he has said? Maybe our path has seemed a little bit that of these children of Israel wandering, but can we trust and rest in what God has written in this word? I hope by God's grace you can say yes. You can say yes. That's, that's the message here. We also see in verses 9 through 18, which we're going to look at next time, his provision made for judges over them, men to lead them, so that they were not left without guidance. And certainly we need that. You know, when you consider that we're sheep, uh, sheep need God. Sheep need shepherds, under shepherds. We need the shepherd, but the Lord has provided for, for his people. And then verses 19 to 33, the reminder of their unbelief and murmuring uh, upon the report of the spies. You know, I know most of us don't like to go back and remember these things. Uh, there's parts of the Bible that when you come across them, they, they strike up in our minds uh, bad memories if you will, or memories of things of, of our past wherein we fell. And yet, uh, it's still the word. And these are things that, that, again, are written for our learning and for understanding. We don't hide from our sin. Anybody that tries to say, oh, I don't want to talk about that anymore, simply because it was, it, it was a period of time in our life where we failed or uh, and we're still living the consequence. All these things the Lord uses to cause us to look to him. And uh, so again, he's going to remind them of why this 11-day journey <laughs> took 40 years. And then of the sentence in verse 34 of this chapter, the sentence passed on them for it. Um, it says, And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see the good land which I swear to give unto your father, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Again, when you think about it, that's, that's really why this judgment was 40 years. The Lord purposed it that long to kill off every one of those that, that uh, were not his. And God is just in his judgments. Again, this is where men don't like to read the word because they, they say, well, we ought to just talk about God being love. Well, he, he is a God of love toward those that he's purposed to save and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he is a God of wrath. And where that wrath has not been satisfied, men will most certainly know it and experience it and find it out. But in this message, I just want to deal with these few verses here, verses 1 through 8 that I mentioned to you regarding the promise of God, the promise of God. When we talk about the Word of God, we're talking about the promise of God, we're talking about the same thing. And we talk all the time about the day, uh, uh, there was a day when your Word was as good as a, <laughs> you know, as a, as a promise. You could just say it and, and it was a contract. Nowadays, even if it's written in pen and ink and, and notarize, it still doesn't mean anything. You can find somebody to come undo it. But you will not find that to be so with God. Exactly what he states in this word is who he is, it's how he deals with men, with sinners. And so if you have any, underst uh, any question as to who God is and how he, how he saves and how he condemns, read this word read this word. It's all there. His word is to be trusted and the purpose of God is faithful. If you look over in Romans chapter 9 Romans chapter 9 this portion right in here verses 1 through 8 of Romans 9 really 
is a great commentary on, on what we're reading here concerning Israel's unbelief and wandering in their 40 years of, under the hand of judgment. Paul says in Romans 9, 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also, uh, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He's thinking about the continued unbelief of the Jews. And as, as I consider even today, over in that land, the Jewish people still are in a state of unbelief for the most part. God has blinded them as far as the truth of the gospel is concerned. And it says here in verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. I truly believe a better translation there is, For I had wished that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul's describing there what he was when he was still a natural Jew without any knowledge of Christ. He, in that state, he preferred to defend his nationalism. He preferred to defend his being a Jew even if it meant him being a curse from Christ because he did not want a thing to do with this Jesus of Nazareth. And that same spirit is in Jews today. Uh, I was I took a Hebrew class up here at Centenary College under Dr. Jana De Benedetti. She has just been named in the paper. If you've, if you've read the paper recently, she's the the rabbi down here at uh, the synagogue, not far from our house. And uh, she, uh, we we were reading through the Old Testament in the Hebrew language. I went back to try to refresh because I had three years of Hebrew and I felt like I just wanted to kind of get a refresher course. And boy, did I get a refresher course! <laughs> but the same blindness and unbelief is is on the Jews, the Jewish people here today, even in this city, as was back in the day of, of Moses. They, they have these types, they have these pictures, but they don't have Christ. And they're happy to have it that way. I believe that's the sense here where he said, I, I had wished that myself were a curse from Christ. I, I enjoyed that position. I preferred to be a curse from that Christ just to be able to, says, for my brother and my kinsman according to the flesh. And you know, that's the way we are even today. We prefer to identify with a denomination. We prefer to identify with an association, some sort of religious organization. Even if nothing of Christ is being taught there, we, we prefer in the flesh, men prefer to be associated with those things and would die unless God is pleased to show mercy and to bring them out. And that's what he's describing here. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the serving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. There's the, we, it's interesting that we are entering into Jewish history Every time we open this Old Testament and, and read from it and preach from it, you just read from Esther, Brother Jim, we are entering into this in a way that the Jew, the natural Jew, can't, although it's his history. It's his history. But he can't enter in because his eyes have never been opened to Christ. And so that same unbelief is there as it was generations ago. Now, here's the part I want you to see. Verse 6, does this mean then that God's purpose has been thwarted? No. His word is just as true whether men believe it or not. His promises are just as true whether you believe it or not. Now, this whole idea of God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. it. It doesn't matter whether you believe it. Put in there God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change it. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. And here, here it is. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Even when 
when God spoke this word and said his, his wrath would be upon that whole generation, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon and to his children. That's distinctive grace. It wasn't that Caleb was any better or any brighter than the rest of the children of Israel. It was that God was pleased to make him an object of his love and favor and grace for Christ's sake and pass by all the rest. Did it work out exactly that way? Exactly that way. That's how I know this word is, is sure. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. There are many that are physical descendants of Abraham that are not children of God. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. We're not to be going around talking about the Jew today being the people of God, the natural Jew. That's what it says here. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The promise. In other words, those that God purposed to save. Not one of them was lost. You know, that's why I encourage us to read this word. It's not how we think God ought to save that he saves that way. It's, how, it's what he says. And so even in dealing with people, when, we, when, when people want to argue and debate with you, we still come back to this word. Well, what does God say? He's never promised to save everybody. Just like he never promised to save that whole generation of Israel. He never promised to. He brought them all out of Egypt and gave them a picture of redemption through the Passover lamb and preserved them as a generation down through the years until Christ would come. But those that died along the way and perished, that did not in any way alter what God said he would do. In fact, he actually brought into the land everyone that he said he would bring in. Just like in salvation, he will save everyone that he has promised to save. Who has he promised to save? Well, those that he's chosen and given to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scriptures say, of them, Christ said, I'll not lose one. I'll lose nothing. All right? I know it's a different message than what you're used to hearing, maybe on radio or in, in, uh, in what churches and preachers are preaching. But you've got to sit down and weigh these things in light of the word. Don't just take another man's word for it. That's how Israel got in trouble in the first place. They started listening to ten other spies and their interpretation of how things were rather than listening to God and his word and the two that were faithful to declare it, Joshua and Caleb, and thereby spent 40 years wandering in the desert and, and perished and perished. But we can see here uh, in the message itself, verse 3, it says, It came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel. Here's what I want you to underline. According unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. Oh, to speak only what God says. And I... I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Pick up certain terminology from men you read and from different writings and then someone questions you about it and suddenly you have to go back and look at the word and say, well, you know what? That really isn't what the word says. That's why we need to stick with, with this word. Uh, let our language, let our definitions, uh, how we define God, how we describe Christ, how we talk about salvation. Let's come back to the word and speak unto men according to all that the Lord has given in commandment unto them. That's why we've had to change some ways of even talking about Christ's death. Everybody's talking about it as an atonement. And then suddenly you go back and look at the word and you realize, well, an atonement is just a covering. Christ, when he died, his death was not just a covering. It was a, a satisfaction. He put away the sin of his people. 
You'll notice in the bulletin this week, uh, even some discussion we had on that, on the terminology of saving knowledge or saving faith. You know, you go back and look in Scripture, look it up in your concordance. The Scriptures never talk about that in those terms. There is the knowledge of salvation. In other words, when God's pleased to reveal the Savior, that uh, the, the heart is drawn to Him. But when you say saving knowledge, what does it do? It makes it sound like there's some certain knowledge that if you know, it'll save you. I'll tell you this, Israel had a lot of knowledge. They had even what we didn't have. They got, had a visual representation of, of, of a satisfaction, of, of wrath, of holiness, every day before their eyes and yet there was no salvation in that knowledge. It was not, there was no revelation of Christ, you see. But the knowledge of salvation, what is the knowledge of salvation other than what God has been pleased to reveal to a poor sinner's heart concerning the Savior, Christ? And that when he died, the sin of his people was put to his account and his, simultaneously, his righteous obedience put once for all to their account. That's the language of scripture. That's the way we need to, we need to speak it as well. All right, so it's a sure word. That's what I want you to see. If there's any confusion in your mind, I'll guarantee you it's not because of the word. It's in your heart. And it's in what you've been to this point submitted to in hearing and understanding. I remember I remember that as the Lord began to work in my heart. How was it that I could go through four years of college, three years of seminary, and spend four years out on a mission field and suddenly have my eyes opened to see that I'd miss Christ? I'll tell you, it just, there's no, unless you've been there, and, and if you hear me preaching against profession and just a, a, you know, a knowledge full of, of uh, terms and things, it's, it's because of how the Lord has led me. And I don't want any one of you sitting here to be in that same state. The Lord's got to teach you. But it's going to be through this word. Look at what the word says with regard to how God is just to justify sinners. Everything else is just, it's vain. And unless, unless the Lord teaches you, you will perish. You will perish. But we can see here, just the, the, in this, in verse 8 is, is really where I want you to, to, to dwell. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. There's a lot of land that's been possessed that the Lord never, never promised. A lot of organization, a lot of religious tradition that people have, have, have uh, embraced that it's nothing but wilderness wandering and perishing. We have to weigh every doctrine. We have to weigh every practice with this word right here. There is a sure land that God has promised. This land that he's promised, I believe, is none other than Christ. It's not, it's not heaven. A lot of people speak of Canaan as if it was heaven. <laughs> if it's heaven, we're all in trouble because there was an awful lot of fighting going on. When they got into that land, there were still enemies to be battled. No, it's, it's a picture of life here as we know it in this world, but what God has promised is what? Rest in Christ. Rest in Christ. That's what he's promised. And that's where our, our blessing is in knowing that the Lord has promised it and the Lord does give it. Not to everybody. He says here, which the Lord swear unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give unto them and to their seed after them. There's a seed that God has promised to give rest to in Christ. And uh, that seed is those that he has chosen. It's like he chose Israel, those for whom Christ came and laid down his life. And uh, they will most certainly enter in. Behold, I have set the land before you. Christ and rest in him is set before us in this written word, but also in the preached word. And we're not to doubt, but believe the record that God has given of his son. May he so grant us the grace to enter in. We'll pick up with this again.
next time, the Lord willing. Our Father, I thank you for this word. I pray that you would direct our hearts and minds to seek after your Son alone, not to be satisfied with a form of religion, godliness, and yet not have any true revelation of Christ with the heart. I pray, Father, that as we go through this book that you would teach us and uh, draw our hearts to your blessed Son. Give you the praise in his precious name. Amen.